Praise the Lord. I'll tell you what. I love hearing testimonies just before you come up and preach because then I'm sitting there listening to this, the testimony that Neil gave and uh, man, that fits perfectly with what we're talking about today from the scripture, what we're looking about at in suffering and, and how God works and moves through it. And if there's one thing you hear that Neil said uh, twice in both, the, both points he was asked, um, God allows us to go through some very hard times so that we are able to see him, to call out to him. And at the moment, though, it may feel incredibly painful for us to where we don't uh, even have the ability to, to grasp with what is taking place. But let some time pass, in this case, eight years, nine years, or eight years later, and you see clearly how God is working and how there's a testimony through it. And uh, this doesn't lessen the pain. This doesn't make pain go away. And by no means should we ever say that as Christians, that uh, you're going to avoid all pain in this life when you come to Jesus Christ. However, there's a purpose to the pain. Uh, I guess maybe a better way of saying it would be there's redemption and there's a redeeming aspect that only God can do in pain. For those outside of Christ, pain is overwhelming. It has no logic to us. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll catch up on this in a minute. But when we're in Christ, there is actually a purpose for it. Though it seems unpurposeless or purposeless at the time, and it seems overwhelming and, and overbearing for us, when we look back, we see how God is guiding us through that. And one such story of this is contained in Exodus chapter 2. Segue to Exodus chapter 2. You might want to grab that in your Bibles as we go there. But in Exodus chapter 2, we have the story of God getting ready to deliver Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage. Now, here's what this looks like for us today. Let's just read it, and we'll unpack a little bit of it here. Exodus chapter 2, verse 23. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery, and they cried out for help, and their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob, and God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. Go to chapter 3, go to verse 7. I think some of these words are going to be repetitive. Listen to this. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of a land to a good land, a broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians opposed them. Come, I will, say, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, but I will be with you. And, you, and this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. In these two texts, we have a couple of phrases that are repeated twice, if not three times. Sometimes three. I have seen, I, I hear, I know, and I have a plan where I'm working. And a lot of times with suffering, when we experience pain, we, we don't have a definition for it. We don't have a purpose for it. It seems hopeless for us. And so, could you imagine being the children of Israel? You are in bondage now. You came in, 70 or so people, 400 years earlier, and you got the best of the land of Goshen. Because your brother or your son was number two in Egypt and was single-handedly basically delivering the whole Middle East from a severe time of famine. And according to the Bible, Joseph acquired all of Egypt for Pharaoh, therefore giving Pharaoh even more power, giving him control of all of Egypt. Joseph is responsible for that. So these cats, when they move into Egypt, Jacob and his sons and his family, they come in in power, 
and dignity and respect and they get the best of the land and everything is going good for them. Fast forward 400 years later, they are now in slavery throwing their boys into the Nile so they can be destroyed by either drowning or fed upon by crocodiles. Wow, that changed drastically. And the text says that the Pharaoh forgot about Joseph. Forgot about every, the new Pharaoh 400 years later had no understanding or no, no knowledge of who the Hebrews were. They were just afraid of them. They were multiplying. They didn't want to lose their country. And they said, we're going to act shrewdly with them. We're going to handle them to such an extent that they don't overrun us. Or, Lord forbid, they fight against us with our enemies and our country is toppled from the inside out. And so they begin to afflict the Hebrews. And it is exact, at that exact moment that the Hebrews begin to call out to their God. Or they cry. I'm not necessarily sure they were calling out to their God. I'll, I'll unpack that in just a second. But nonetheless, they are crying because, because of their pain. And so let me just briefly give you the main point of the sermon. We serve a God who sees and knows everything that's happening in our life. And he is actively involved in redeeming us. And he is actively involved in sanctifying us. And he is actively involved in using us to further the gospel beyond us. The gospel came to us because we are conduit. It is going to someone else. And we see this. And listen, God knows exactly where you are at today in your pain or in your good times. In whatever situation you find yourself in, God is not unaware. There's my sermon. I'm done. We can go home. I just want you to know God is, is aware. However, we are not. However God is aware, we are the exact opposite of that. And I'm going to really just wreck our worlds today, so let's have some fun. Let's look at a couple of things that God is and what we completely reject about him. Number one, God hears. God hears our prayers. It's repeated twice in chapter two and chapter three. God hears our prayers. And I got one question. Why do we not pray to him? If the Bible says God hears our prayers, why does the average Christian not talk to their God in a way that is remotely biblical? Oh, we'll talk to our gods. We'll make it up. I said it correctly. We'll talk to our gods and we'll make it up. But we won't talk to the God, the Lord of all. We want God to usually give us stuff. We want the things of God far more than we want God himself. That's if we do call out to God. For the majority of people that don't call out to God, here's why you don't call out of God, to God. Two reasons. Two reasons why we don't pray. Number one, we think we're all good. Number two, we think we're able. And I'm going to prove this to you because we're Americans. This one comes easy to us. First of all, we think we are good people, and people are generally good. That's the premise we start off from. Darren, no, I don't believe that. <laughs> all right, I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you argued with me. Let me prove that to you. What do you teach your kids? Do you have to teach them to go up to people and talk to them? Do you have to teach these little ones to go up to strangers and take candy? Do you have to teach them to be sociable with other people? Or do you guard your kids from people? How about this one? When somebody knocks on your door, do you take a prone position, shut the lights off, kill the TV, and be like, surely it's dangerous people coming to our house at 4.30 in the afternoon. Kids, nobody move. Everybody hide behind the walls. Dude, when we were kids growing up, and someone came over, my mom was like, you want some tea? I got some cake for you. You want some cookies? Like, we entertain people. My brother and I were like, will they ever leave so we can go back to playing and, and hanging out? Today, we're like, get the guns. Because <laughs> everybody breaks in our home and kills us every night. I have no understanding of why we do this. Ah, oh, but I do. We say we think people are good, but we, exact, we teach the exact opposite to our short-stacked children. 
and we tell them, don't talk to strangers. Don't take candy for them. Don't, I, I'm going to hawk you. We don't even let our kids play in our backyards for fear that somebody's just going to like teleport. Been watching too much Star Trek or something. I don't know. Like, come in the backyard, they're going to steal our kids. Why do we do that? Because we don't actually believe people are good people. We just really want to believe we're good people. And so we know it would be arrogant to be like, Wes is a terrible dude, but I, I'm going to cast me out, baby. I am a good person. I am the one you want to look at. You know you can't say that. Everyone's going to give you a hard time if you say that thing. So what do we say? People are good. No, 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 no. You don't believe that. You just believe you're good. I just believe I'm good. We believe my kids are good. See, we get stuck in Genesis 1 and 2, and we think that we, are the, we fit the bill of Genesis 1 and 2. Behold, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And we think we're innocent, and we're sinless, and we're pure. But we forget that Genesis 3 follows Genesis 2. That's how numbers work, right? 3 follows 2. And in the story of chapter 3, you realize, oh man, they blew it. They blew it bad. They had one law, and that waited like 10 minutes. There wasn't even a baby. It took less than a year to break that law, apparently. That's just my take on it. You don't have to, you don't have to believe that, but I'm thinking, if you read the text, you know what's going on there. You guys track with me? I'm trying not to go into incredibly descriptive detail about this. But nonetheless, there's no baby, and they eat from the tree. <laughs> a year. Tops before they decide to reject the word of God. How many laws do we have that we try to follow? I can't even follow the speeding one. I couldn't follow this morning. I'm coming to preach, and I promise you, I sinned on the way to church. Just with that stupid speed limit thing. The victimless crime. Anyways, I digress. But you sit here and you say, we are good people. If I'm a good person, I don't really need to go to God. I mean, Jesus is just some, like, guru that's just coming to make me a little bit better. I mean, I'm not really a sinful person damned to hell. I'm just a good person. So God just makes a little bit better. Then we think we're able. And so even if I am not necessarily good, I can fix myself. I got one objection to this. It's from the female perspective, and it's called marriage. Ladies, fixing that husband much? Man, you can't fix anything related to us. But we sit there and we think, oh, I'm able. I can do this. I remember a program in the military called uh, Pick Yourself Up by Your Bootstraps. Anybody remember hearing that? Military people hear that? Like, you can send yourself to college. You can make yourself a better person. You can undo God. Wait, did he just say that? No, he didn't. I just interpreted that for you. But I remember, pick yourself up by your bootlaces or your bootstraps. Think about the stupid things we've heard growing up. Get a cut, rub some dirt in it. What does that do? What kind of sadistic coach did I have? Just rub some dirt. It hurts, I know. It's so awesome. I just figured you'd do it. And so you're rubbing dirt in it. Grin and bear it. Put some elbow grease into it. That's just straight nasty. You got grease on your elbow. Clean that stuff up. Think of all the stupid things you've been told. You can take it. You can make it. Just believe in yourself. Mm, yeah, you're going to go straight to hell on that one. Positive words. I can be the president of the United States. I can be the president of the United States. Honey, you can be the president of the United States. Let me tell you how stupid that is. In a lifetime, no more than 20 people will be the president in the United States. The average lifetime, no more than 20 people out of the 300 million Americans will be president of the United States. I can't, I mean, I, I love doing math, but my brain can't even commute, compute 20 out of 300 million. That's like not even measurable. You can do it. You're a moron. They can't do it. Your kid can't write his name. I mean, that actually might be qualifications now, but nonetheless, you're sitting there going, you can't do it. But we are told this from growing up that you are good and you are able. That's ridiculous. 
But that's why we don't go to the Lord. That's why we don't pray. See, pain, though, lets you see just how weak we are. I mean, sleeping should do this for us, but usually it takes pain. What, what do you mean sleeping should do this? Our life is so terrible that it takes us the better part of our life to be able to function in our life. You will spend a third of your life unconscious because the two-thirds you were awake for was so draining, you have to stop and recover. I'm not so sure we should be so confident in ourselves. I mean, who's had a kid like this? Just playing around. And they're down, they're down on the ground sleeping. I mean, they're just running through the house, top of their lungs, peeking. Like, did you really just fall asleep in the middle of the kitchen floor? Full step. They're out. That should show you that kid is, is sort of doomed. I mean, like, if you can't make it to your bed... You are weak. My friends make fun of me because, man, I check out at 9 to 9.30 wherever I'm at. I don't care. I don't care where we're at. 9 o'clock, I am done being nice. I'm going home. I'm going to bed. Because by 10 o'clock, I'm probably going to be asleep in your chair. I'm not going to be good for conversation anyways. So by 9 o'clock, I'm like, day's over. I got nothing I'm going home. But we can't like use basic, basic arithmetic or logic and put this together and know, hmm, I got to sleep for eight hours of every 16-hour day. I must not be able. What are the first words that come out of a kid's mouth? No and screaming. Sometimes together. That's not a good kid. But no, we got it. That's why we don't pray. When you don't pray and you don't seek the Lord, the next thing that we see is we forget that God is faithful. See, God says, look, I hear and I remember. Point number two here is that God is faithful. He remembers his word and his promises. But y'all, we forget this. We forget this because we're so caught up in ourselves and doing things our way by our standards. We're so in love with me that I don't think that I need thee. What we think is that it's just about, I can do this, I can grin and bear it, I can make it happen. And when we go internal and we just think about ourselves, we lose complete focus of who God is. And what do we do? When we lose the fact that God is faithful, we, we, we still like the idea of God. But when we don't know that he's faithful, we don't believe we can trust him because we're not seeing him work in our life because we're separating ourselves from him. We're divorcing ourselves from him. When that happens, and we, and we know that God is faithful, but we don't actually see how he's faithful, then what you do is you reinvent God. You know how you reinvent God? You make him like you. See, God is so not like us. To whom will you liken unto me, he says. And that's just one verse, but you could pull at least 20 verses out of the Bible that where God is saying, I am unique. Who can you compare to me? The answer is, I don't think we're up. Who can you compare to God? Yeah, I don't know what you said, but it sounded like, it sounded like no one. No one. You can compare no one to God. Listen, a computer gives witness that there is intelligent life, but it is not intelligent life. It's a computer. And a person gives witness that there is a God, but that person is not God. They're a creation of God. So you and I turning inward on ourselves to try to understand God by, I just feel God's like this way. I wish God would just let me feel what I want to feel, which is my hand across someone's face when they say that. Like you, don't, you don't get to feel God and define him. We have objective truth for that. I mean, like, it's, it's true. I just feel God would never do anything mean. You got two-thirds of the Bible arguing against that. You got the book of Revelation that's scary. You know, thunder, th thunder and lightning, very, very frightening. That kind of scary. That's happening all over the pages of the Bible. That God is righteous in judgment. Well, I just don't, I'm not comfortable with a judging God. I 
don't care what you're comfortable with. Hell is uncomfortable by definition. But what we do is we forget to go to God. We have no connection of who God is at that point. So then we like the idea of a God. Ecclesiastes 3.11, God has hidden eternity in all of our hearts. We crave God. We were built for worship. So then what we do is we have to take that God, and since we don't know who he is, we replace it with our own definition. The Bible clearly teaches God is faithful, but in our pain we go, why? Where are you at, God? I'm sorry, how can you say God is faithful and... Where are you, God? The Psalms even show this. God, where are you at? Oh yeah, you are faithful. I will trust in you. In a single Psalm, David looks that schizophrenic. He starts off by going, you've forgotten me, God. My God is good. He's my rock, my deliverer. What fixed it? Hint, actually seeking the Lord. He came to God with a jacked up view of God. God is gone. And then prays, seeks God and goes, oh, my bad. God is here. He is my rock, my foundation. I am built on him. He is whom I will trust. He is my banner. He is my hope. But we forget because we neglect God. So then we redefine God the way we want God to be. He's no longer faithful. He's faithless like us. Except the scripture disagrees with that. Even if man is faithful, God is, even if man is unfaithful, God is faithful, for God cannot deny himself, is what Paul is teaching. So when God says, I'm putting myself out there for you, he's not taking himself back. I love this. John says this, even if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. Even when you believe the lie, that God has forgotten me and I am worthless. That's actually, that part is actually truthful. But even when you believe, I can't ever go to heaven. If God has promised it, he is greater than your word. His command that you have life supersedes your thought that you don't. For those who are in Christ, right? Little asterisk there. You need to be saved to spend time with Christ. But look, we change who God is. You stop seeking God, you lose the faithfulness in view of God. God is still faithful. He will not undo who he is. But you just don't know it. We're oblivious to it. Which then means we, get, we redefine God how we want. When we redefine God how we want to or how we think it, it, we make him look like us, we lose the fact that God is aware. When he says, for I know, uh, God knew, verse 25 of chapter 2 of Exodus, God saw the people of Israel and God knew. And then when you go down to verse, um, chapter 3, verse 7, he says, I know their sufferings. Let me tell you what this is. This is God being aware. Another word for that would be, he cares. God cares cares. He is not blind. He sees what is taking place. I love this, but you lose this when we turn to ourselves. When we think we are good and we think we are able, we forget that God is faithful. We reshape God how we want him to be, and the direct result of that is then God doesn't see anymore. See, when you make God out like you, You have a huge problem. You are only concerned about yourself. So if your God is only concerned about himself, where do you fall in the mix? Hint, you don't. Darren, I don't understand or believe what you're saying. Okay. Let me introduce you to one idea. The Greek pantheon of gods were noble, benevolent, and caring. Right? Who doesn't know what I'm talking about? Hands up. All right, so then what were they? Selfish, evil, petty, conceited. When you make a God up how you want him to be or she or it to be, it's going to look like the pantheon of gods, which is just worse characteristics or our characteristics, but even worse. So they're unaware. They could care less. Let me put it into proper context for us. Who has seen uh, Wrath of the Titans? Come on. Four of us? Scratch that point. 
<laughs> All right, moving on. So, page whatever. You can just kill that point. Homework. Go watch that movie and look how petty those gods are. That's how most of us think God is. We take the Greek pantheon of God, Clash of the Titans, Wrath of the Titan, Titans kind of thing. It's a modern movie. Some of you should get out more. Anyways, it's, uh, it, we take that view of God and we say that is exactly what, what Yahweh is like. Okay, but if he's like that, then he could care less about you. He's only concerned with himself. See, one thing that Christianity gives us is a God who watches over us. I mean, this is what you believe when you quote things like, God has numbered our hairs. Or he has, he knows exactly how many grains of sand are in the world. Or he knows the distances between the stars. What you're saying is God is observant and pays attention and sees what is happening in life. You remove that God and you make him like you and you lose the ability to go to God and be like, God, do you see? I'm struggling with this. God's like, no, man, I was sleeping. I'm sorry, what? What are we talking about? And because we think that way, we don't pray. Do you see how this is all connected? You don't pray because you think you're able and you're good. You don't go to God because we think we're good. The result is we should reshape God. Well, then once we reshape God, we don't actually want to go to that God anyways. Now we're eating our own tail. We're a snake eating its tail. It's not going to get better. You need something to break that. What do we need for God to break it? We need God to have a plan. It's going to sound very similar to the third point, but point number four, God is sovereign. He knows exactly what will happen and what he's doing. The first or the third point was God knows, but that's the more intimate caring know I'm talking about, how God sees, over, sees and watches over us. But this last point is God's interaction with his creation. This is the only way, it's behind me, this is the only way we have any hope. It's for God to do what we never could do ourselves. When you look at the Exodus, yes, it's miraculous. But let me go ahead and tell you this. You being dead, getting a new life in Jesus Christ is even more miraculous than a couple of uh, walls of water in the Red Sea that you walk across on dry ground. A levee could do that. And a hair dryer. It'd take time. God just did it like that. But you know what nothing can do? Bring life to death. But God did. So when you see the book of Exodus, what you see is a small that foreshadows the whole. God rescuing us, showing us his sovereignty, moving us in his plan, even when we're jacked up. Let me prove to you how jacked up the Israelites were at this time. God calls Moses in chapter 3. It's the, it's the verses just after chapter 7 here. I mean, verse 7. He calls Moses. He says, go, I'm going to send you to them. And Moses is like, wait, what's his name? Chapter 3, verse 13. Moses shouts out to, to God. He goes, I, you're going to send me to the Israelites, and they're going to ask, what's his name? I'm going to say, God sent me to you. They go, what's his name? That's not coy. They don't know. They have forgotten their God. That's why God has to introduce himself to Moses. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why? They forgot their God. God just isn't saving 3,500 years of history here or when he gave this to Moses and just wasting the title, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. No, he's revealing who he is. Jesus will later add to this that those guys are living. That's why we believe in the resurrection because God is the God of the living. That's a freebie. You can drop a few extra point, point, uh, bucks in the offering plate if you want. Seeing how that's not going to come around because we have a box, go ahead and do it in the box. But that said, when you see that, that God knows and he's sovereign, he works and he introduces, he reintroduces himself to the Israelites. You heard Neil say on his uh, testimony, I recommitted? When I recommitted? 
What's that mean? It means God reintroduced himself to us when we forgot. That's what that means. We all have that, right? Anybody got those like recommitted moments in your life? Anybody awake? Two fingers, pulse, come down two inches over one. Is it beating? Okay, let's try that again. Anybody have a recommitted moment in their life? Thank you. What that means is God reintroduced himself to you. You can't get born again again. So either you were lost and got saved at that time, or you were saved and forgot your God, and God's like, I love you too much, and I'm too sovereign to leave you in the desert, to leave you in slavery to your sin. Here I am. And he does that to us. That's what we mean by recommitted. It's God reintroducing himself to us because we have a tendency to forget, and our sovereign God does that for us. This is why I love the Lord. I got a long quote I got to read here. This is from a guy I completely disagree with, and all you will as well. The total, and he's, here's, let me set it up. He's talking about suffering, and he's struggling with any kind of belief in God. But I want you to hear the despair and the hopelessness in what some people consider a brilliant man. The despair that is in his voice or in his writing when he's talking about what goes on in the world around us and when you divorce the idea of there being a God. The total amount of suffering per year in the natural world is beyond all decent contemplation. He can't understand is what he's saying. During the minute that it takes me to compose this sentence, thousands and thousands of animals are being eaten alive. Many others are running for their lives, whimpering with fear. fear. Others are slowly being devoured from within by rasping parasites. Thousands of all kinds of di- are dying of starvation, thirst, and disease. And it must be so. If there is ever, a t- ever is a time of plenty, this very fact will automatically lead to an increase in the population until the natural state of starvation and misery is restored. The, the, the what? The natural state of misery and starvation is what he says the world tends towards. Misery and starvation. It needs to be restored because when we feel like we're in a time of plenty, it's just the universe getting ready to reset itself towards starving again. And I'm okay with this, is what he's saying. It gets better or worse, depending upon your viewpoint. He goes, uh, Misery is restored. In a universe of electrons and selfish genes. What? Blind physical forces and genetic re- or replication. Some people are going to get hurt. Other people are going to get lucky. And you won't find any rhyme or reason in it. Nor any justice. I will argue you don't want justice. I don't want justice. If God levies justice against us, we're in trouble. We have put our hand in the face of God and wagged it or shook it. Justice is our demise. But anyways, the universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. This guy's name is Richard Dawkins. And most people quote him and love him and and celebrate this idea. Except there's a contradiction in his own idea. He is using rhyme, reason, and purpose to argue there is no rhyme, reason, or purpose. Hmm, that's a logical fallacy. In addition to that, he believes he's right when there is no reason to be right or good or evil. Another logical fallacy. He believes in a thing called selfish genes in what is no without rhyme or reason. So I'm sitting here going, whoa, dude, did you go full moron on a sentence or a paragraph? Like, selfish genes. Now, he'll probably argue that that just means we tend to try to stay alive. And that's his selfish, not like a moral selfishness. Fine, whatever. But why would you try to stay alive? If what we exist for is the next better existence of something else, if we're all morphing, better word for us we're familiar with, evolving into something else, then why should we try to even hold on to our life? Why drive a car? Why get out of bed? Why not put a gun to your head and kill yourself? If you have no purpose in life, if there is no moral or good, how hopeless, or even evil for that matter, how, how e- hopeless is life? Why do you even want to believe this? 
But this is the natural location for a person that rejects God. Oh, he's terrible. Anybody fasted and prayed and sought the Lord this week? How about today? Have we sought to know him from his word? Low blow? Below the belt? Did I just do that to you guys? We want to basically charge these heretic atheist individuals for not seeking God. But my question is, do I? If I think I'm good and I think I'm able, why do I not? I, I don't seek God. So why should I charge this guy with doing the same thing I'm doing, but at least he has the integrity to take it to its fullest end? Which I love this because you see there's no logic in it. Take that position to its fullest end and you're like, I don't want that position. There's no hope. There's no reason for existence. There's no reason to even make love, eat good food, build things. Why does it matter if there's no purpose? If there's no good. That's the location of somebody who rejects God. And it began with not spending time with the Lord. When we close our ears to the call that God puts on our lives and we don't go into him, you will change who God is. You will make him fit who you want him to be. That will leave you unsatisfied, unfulfilled. You will then change him again or you'll change churches or you'll change spouses or you'll change homes or you'll change careers or you'll change underwear. I don't know. You'll change something until you get to the end where you're like, there's nothing worth changing anymore except God. And you will move from a position of theism, of belief in a God to a position of agnosticism I don't know if I can even know, so I don't care. And then you just move into a state of atheism. A guy wrote a book on this called Craig Groeschel. It was called The Christian Atheist. And he was arguing that most Christians, so-called Christians, hold to atheism, though they know they can't, but their life demonstrates that they really don't believe in God, that God is living and that we need to go after him. So they live as atheists, though they identify themselves as Christians. Let me tie this up for us, and we'll, we'll conclude with this, and then I've got one thing I've got to bring up to you guys. Our tendency to veer towards atheism as Christians to a position to where we live against God, we live with ourselves in mind, is what's killing our churches. It's what's killing our families. It's what's killing us. I want to tell you, what we shoot for at New Hope is so simple that a five-year-old could reproduce it. What are we trying to do? Praise, pray, and proclaim who God is. And it's all rooted in the word of God. You can't do it apart from the word of God. I have the same message. I change some of the words up every week. But it feels like the same thing on a week in, a week in and week out basis. I'm just calling you to the Lord. Look, I can't change you. You can't change anybody else. My wife has tried to change me for the 14, I don't know how long we've been married. Four, I'm assuming it's 14 years. 14 years of marriage that we've been, please don't quote me on that. Wes, I need you to cut that out, please. <laughs> if she watches this, I'm doomed. But she has tried to change me over that time. She just finally threw in the towel a couple of years ago and said, I'm stuck with that mess. I think I liked when she was trying to change me. But... I'm joking. But you sit here and go, man, we can't change ourselves. Anybody have a sin that you can't seem to get away from? That even if, check this out. Here's what I mean by you can't get away from it. That even if you stop physically acting upon that sin, you still think about it. And you still always have this desire to want to do it. You didn't get free from it just because you stopped physically doing it. It's eating your soul. It's cancer in your mind. That should show us we can't fix ourselves. But anybody have a sin that you're like, I, I had it one day and then I don't. I don't know what happened. I just was praying and reading and worshiping the Lord and the, the sin was gone. I don't know. Anybody know how that happened? Yeah, it's called sanctification, fool. 
It's, it's what occurs when you seek the Lord. But when we do it our own way, we just get miserable. That also starts with an S. It's called sin. We just sin when we do it our own way. So our call at the church is simply this. Seek the Lord. We have stripped just about everything fun from the church that might remotely sound like this. They rose up and sang and played. Did you read that this week? No, that's actually next week, two weeks from now. Hint, it's in Exodus. And it's where they make the golden calf and they rode, the people rose up to play and worshiped a calf. I'm gonna agree with Matt Chandler on this one. Why not a lion? Oh, look, our God, it's a calf. Nah. It's powerful. That's the one that delivered us. Not like a war eagle or a tiger or a bear, even a polar bear we would take. For crying out loud, a seal, a calf. Here's your bottle. I, I grew up on a farm a little bit, fed these things. You're like, oh, you're so terrifying. Oh, look at you push that bottle hard. Yes, that's our God. It's a calf. Oh my goodness. How could you be that dumb? Sin. They did it their own way. And we do the same thing. Just calling you, guys, seek the Lord. We're stripping all of the exterior of what every church is supposed to be so you have time to read the word, to praise God, to pray with God, with others, and to proclaim God. Anything else is a waste of time for the church. But we will do whatever we can do to get people into that time. And this is why I'm inviting you into it as well. This is what the Lord has called us to. I am tired of preaching a message to myself, which I just did, of saying, seek the Lord. And they're like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go try harder and do this thing. Like, I swear, as I walk out those two doors, like, I'm going to make it where Alex is at, and then somewhere on that white linoleum or whatever that is, before I get out of the second set of doors, I'm going to go stupid and try to live by my own power again. There's, like, something bad about that room. I'm going out those doors today. But that said, like, I go self-reliant as soon as I walk out of this building. I'm tired of that. I'm sure you are as well. So just seek the Lord. Let me pray. I'm going to ask you to stay in your seats for a second. I just got to share something with you, and then I'll let you go. Father, I thank you for how great you are. Lord, most importantly, we thank you that you are in control, that your sovereignty gives us hope. That C.S. Lewis said, you shout to us in our pain. Let us look up to you right now to set aside whatever we've been trying to do to satisfy ourselves. And instead, let us walk with you and to know who you are and to enjoy you. Lord, I thank you for your patience. I thank you that you are so long-suffering with me. I commit the same sins every day of the week, sometimes even the same time each day. And I feel the guilt. I'm like, God, I'm gonna get it better the next day. And I've been saying this now for 18 years. And yet you're just now allowing me to see that it is not about getting it better or doing it better. I just need to spend time with you. Jesus, call out to us through your Holy Spirit that lives in us that we would spend more time with you. If someone is in here and they do not know you as Lord, I ask that they would call out to you, say, forgive me of my sins. Give me the life that comes to you. And that they would either fill a card out in the seat back in front of them or contact me or Wes or anyone else around them and say, we just want to talk to you about what's going on in my life. Lord, we love you. And we love that you love us. Help us to walk with you. It's through your holy name we pray. Amen.